Hello everyone. So, um, basically the idea is that I will simply answer all the questions you might or might not have. So, if you got anything on top of your head, just write it in the comments on the, which should be on one or the other side. And otherwise, I will tell you a couple of other stories. So, while everybody's being flooded with kind of bad news these days, and it's all over the news, so everybody knows about COVID-19 by now, and I guess it's a topic that keeps buzzing into everybody's head, but also it had a few upsides to it. So for example, the canals in Venice, for the first time in decades, you can actually see the bottom of them again, and you can see the fish swimming down below, which is pretty amazing. In Italy, in many harbors, the dolphins are coming back into the big ports, which is also quite nice to see. And there has been videos of that buzzing around on social media all the way. So that's good, mostly because the noise level in the oceans is a lot lower these days because all the private boats are locked down. Lots of commercial shipping is also pretty much off or at least cut down to a minimum. So that means it's nice and quiet again in the mat, which is incredible in many ways. On the minor side, it also means that lots of yaris are actually stuck in the harbors, in the marinas or in big ports. And that's actually including us ourselves. So our boat is right now on Egina near Athens and we are stuck in Austria, unable to get back to it, even though things are coming in. So we got our dinghy secured, we got a whole bunch of stainless steel that just arrived in my hometown in Spital. And yeah, unfortunately, we can't yet get it to work. Um, yeah, but one of the questions I got in, well, in the comments before this even started was about the uh, seagrass and why the heck we would focus on seagrass so much. And really, the answer is pretty simple because, well, seagrass as such, especially for swimmers and snorkelers, is not really a beauty because it's this dark patch somewhere below the water and it's kind of creepy to swim over it and it doesn't look particularly friendly from the top. But the bottom line is that seagrass is also an amazing breeding ground. So lots of fishes are actually meeting in there to mate and lots of juveniles are living in there for a while. So especially when it comes to wrasses, you will find quite a few where the juveniles, like tiny ones, they're actually colored green, so they really blend into the seagrass meadows and have a nice hiding spot for all the predators. So that's the place where they grow old and stay safe until they are big enough to go hunting themselves. So in many ways it is needed for all those species, but also it is an incredible habitat for other things to grow on. So you will find lots of sessel animals that grow on the seagrass and just use to get off the ground. And you will also find lots of algae that grow on seagrass, again, to be off the ground and to have some solid substrate to grow on. Because generally speaking, seagrass only grows on loose substrates, which means sand, silt, like everything loose. And from there, starting from there, it can also grow over rocks at good occasions. But all in all, it's stabilizing the loose substrates, just like every plant, every tree that grows on land, which also means if this is gone, there's no roots holding all the sediment in place, and ultimately all the sand and, well, at some point also the islands just wash away, which is pretty much what has been happening in northern Germany, for example. So there they have lots of these really flat islands that are only like two, three meters above the ground in some cases. And because the bottom trawlers, beam trawlers, all sorts of trawlers, they have been dragging big nets across the bottom. And ultimately the seagrass was gone and the island started to disappear. So right now Germany is actually investing millions every year to keep pouring sand on top of the island so they don't disappear altogether. And that's something we would like to avoid as best as we can. And this year is actually a great chance to really do that because in the Adriatic, the Posidonia, which is the big Neptune's grass, um, actually is growing seeds. So those seeds we can really collect, fix them on stones, on structures, on frames, on 
anything that we can find really. And well, historically they have been doing it with cable ties, which is obviously not the ultimate solution because it just means adding plastic back to the sea. Um, but luckily there's also biodegradable options that will only last about a month below the water, which is perfect for our purpose because it means we can zip tie them with such a biodegradable zip tie to a stable substrate and then it will start growing its roots and ideally grow them into the soil or into the rock because most of the rocks are pretty brittle and then can start growing from there and that means all of a sudden we have a chance to repopulate seagrass meadows that have been completely gone in the last decades and especially in the northern Adriatic, but also wide parts of the Mediterranean altogether, meadows have been vanishing. And that means that the breeding ground is gone. It also means that the sand can just get washed away. And, well, ultimately we have to start working against that so we can actually, yeah, protect the environment there. And one of the common questions or one of the common, uh, common comments we had was why anybody would actually want to participate in it and my personal take is still that I like to think that everybody who spends time on the water underwater actually has some sort of tendency to take care of the environment underwater as well so we are aiming at dive centers so if anybody knows of a dive center that might be willing and interested in participating in something like that we want to train them up to a stage where they are able to start doing the work with us or for us ultimately, while we still come back and visit every single shop, every single participant of the whole mission every year and see how things are going. And what I really like about the whole idea is that it all kind of fits in a big community effort. So on the one side, you have the dive centers who are actually planting it, on the other hand, you also have, for example, fishermen who still keep using the nets, but every time they pull up the net, chances are they drag out seagrass with it, but they could just bring the little plants that they rip out back to the dive center for them to plant them again, which also, again, is a nice start to start a dialogue between the two of them. And then the dive center can clearly communicate with the fishermen where they are already planting, and therefore the fishermen would better take care of that particular area or avoid it altogether and not go fishing in that particular spot. And then you can also extend it to whatever range you want. I mean, my ideal vision would be that, for example, in every marina, you have a big bucket on the pier where people who ripped out cigarettes with the anchors, which still does happen quite a lot, actually, they can just bring the plants back to the next marina that they go in, throw it in the bucket, in the evening, the dive center picks it up and starts planting again the next day. So it all comes together in many nice ways. And ultimately, it also is a great defense against the uh, invasive species, which brings me back to one of the questions that I had earlier already. So the question was, what exactly is an invasive species and what makes it invasive? Um, yeah. Yes. And Liam just asked about invasive seagrasses. So invasive basically means that a species that doesn't belong in a particular area is showing up there all of a sudden. So when it does that, it's an introduced species, which doesn't make it invasive yet. So every invasive species is introduced, but not every introduced species is invasive. So that again means that once it shows up in a new area, be it the lion fish in the Mediterranean or in the Caribbean, or it could be algae as well, like the Colepa taxifolia that came out of the aquarium in Monaco that made headlines around the world. So when they start making damage of some sort, then we're talking about invasive species. So for example, the lionfish that is eating away on local fish stocks, or the Colepa, this algae that was just growing over all the local algae, so that makes it invasive. Um, in terms of the fish, the main thing that we have to do right now is to actually keep a count on them. So in theory, the research world knows that the lionfish has entered the Mediterranean and they know that it has touched treaty. 
in reality, in Crete, two years ago was the first sightings. Yes, absolutely true. But also, end of last season, it was near impossible to do a dive where you wouldn't see 40 or more of these lionfish in the south of Crete. And we then started a data collection with lots of divers throughout the Mediterranean and found out that really they are already way up in the Adriatic. And we had people from Rubin, which is northern Croatia, so pretty much the northern end of the Adriatic, that sent us pictures of lionfish in that area. And when I got the first one, I thought, okay, that's that must be wrong, it just can't be. But then within a week, I got three pictures from different divers of flying fish in Rubin. And chances are it was the same one over and over again, because in theory, they need 18 degrees of water temperature year round. So my hope is that they didn't last through the winter. And however many it was, one or a hundred, that they are not there anymore. But really, we are only about to find out this year. And the controlling invasive seagrass that Liam is asking about, actually, I heard about it the first time, uh, yeah, just about a month ago at the boat fair in Dusseldorf, because there was a dive center that is based in the northern end of the Red Sea. And they told us they have incredible meadows of seagrass. But yeah talking to the guys in Cyprus, which would be kind of the entry point where you have a decent amount of divers again, they said the seagrass there is vanishing. So in a way, they would wish for an invasive seagrass to show up and start growing. But ultimately, seagrass is not really good when it comes to invading an area because it does grow quick, the grass itself. But for a meadow, it takes quite a long time. And just to clarify it here, so seagrass kind of grows like a pl uh, palm tree on land. So you have the leaves on the very top, which grow pretty damn fast. So they can do a few centimeters a week. But then you have the brown, like, bushy stuff that's outside the soil, but growing pretty slow. So there we're talking about one to two, maybe in good conditions, three centimeters a year. So that is growing rather slow. And then obviously you have the roots that are actually down in the substrate. But that means that seagrass, when it just grows in a meadow, it can only grow about yeah two, three centimeters sideways every year, which also means that, for example, if you drop an anchor in a seagrass meadow and you cut kind of a trawl through it, that is only 30 centimeters wide and a couple of meters long, it will take at least 15 years for that meadow to close that gap. So that is pretty impressive. And for a seagrass that could be newly introduced, it either has to grow into the Mediterranean, which is at this point quite unlikely because, well, for one, the Suez Canal, the connection between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea is getting dredged out over and over again. So whatever might or might not be growing there will be pulled out some, at some stage. And the other thing that could happen is that seeds actually make it into the Mediterranean. But at this point, I did not hear any reports yet of anything coming in. So that would actually be an interesting one to keep an eye on. But yeah, in terms of the invasive species that are fish, we have quite a few already. And by now we're talking I think the latest number I saw was 1,200 introduced species that came from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, not all of those are fishes. There's some mussels, there's lots of small crabs and things that are actually living in the sand or in the gaps in between the sand. And strangely enough, at the University in Vienna, there's quite an active working group dealing with all of those. And if there's any questions to that, I'll happily talk to these guys and come back with some more answers. But yeah, for me, the easy ones to keep an eye on right now are the fish. And since we're all stuck in our homes right now, I think an amazing thing would be if we could get a hand on lots of divers in the area that might still be out there and going snorkeling every day, since you would probably do it alone or with one buddy anyway, so it should be fine even these days. And if they see anything that is new to them, just give a holler. And 
the good thing is there's a couple of NGOs out there that are working on issues like that. For example, in Greece, you got IC. So they have a big program called uh, Is It Alien to You? And that's it. So basically, whenever you see something that you're not familiar with, even though you know the area, you would just let them know, sh shoot them an email or send a report, picture ideally, and then they would spread the knowledge to the universities, which is basically the same that we are doing, uh, with the difference that they are really focusing on the Greek waters. And in our case, we are trying to cover all of the Mediterranean. And ultimately, for the next year, the plan would be to actually really cover the map. But for that, yeah, I guess, first of all, we have to get out of our houses. And then we also need to grow our team and aim to have a couple more people and ideally one or two more boats for the next year. OK, so that's the questions I had so far. So since there's nine people right here now, anything you guys want to know? Otherwise, I will just keep blobbing away, and it might not exactly be what you want to hear. No? OK, then um, one of the other things that we want to focus on this year will be marine debris. So that's basically everything that is floating around in the sea. and. Well, marine plastics and beach cleanups by now have made quite an impression and lots of people are participating in them, which is great and absolutely amazing to see. Actually, the cruises in the Mediterranean started at Trash Tuesday, I think it's called. So every Tuesday, wherever they are anchored, they would go and start cleaning a beach. Of course, not everybody is participating, but more and more people are trying to take part in this. And that's also something we want to pursue and push a little bit more and, well, basically grow the community of people who are actually doing this. And thank God there's also initiatives who actually make use of the plastic that is collected. So one of the things we realized, especially in Myanmar and Thailand, is all the plastic you collect, you bring it back to shore and you bring it to the right facilities, as you would think. And a couple of hours later, you see somebody dumping all the trash that you just collected back into a river. So that's obviously not the way things should be. So not at the ideal. And by now, we actually found a couple of companies that are looking for marine trash to go back to them. One of them is a company called Bracenets in Hamburg. So whenever we find ghost fishing nets, we would collect them, send them back to them. They clean them and make them into nice little bracelets, which is pretty cool in many ways, because it's, well, for, for us, mostly a nice conversation starter. And for them, it is obviously a business idea. But also, it means that the dive centers that collect the nets with us, they can then use those brace nets to sell them back in the shop. And basically, you tell a full, nice, round story to your customers. It's like, hey. So these bracelets are actually made out of nets that we collect with you, for example, if you want to participate. But then there's also other companies. My personal favorite was one that I came across in Düsseldorf again during the boat show. And they use trash that is collected out of the sea to make fins out of them. And then there's plenty of companies that make sunglasses and all other sorts of things. So there is options out there to not just throw it away, but actually make something nice. Um, so, and Dodo is asking how country or landlocked countries contribute to marine debris and how we could reduce it. And short answer is, yes, we do contribute. We definitely do. And reducing it is <laughs> ultimately the little sacrifices that everybody makes. I mean, every piece of plastic, every piece of any trash does end up in the ocean one way or the other. So even if you throw away a cigarette butt in Vienna, somewhere near the Donau Canal or the Danube, it will find its way down to the sea. I mean, it's going to be the Black Sea to start with, but it will find its way to the Mediterranean or other places on the long run. And the strange thing for me is that 
most people don't even think about the big amounts of plastic. Like, I mean, when you're driving a car, first thought is, okay, it's burning fuel, so it is clearly producing CO2, which is kind of feeding back into the whole climate change thing. But also everybody knows that you have to eventually change the tires on your car. And so nobody seems to think the next step that all this rubber that you're rubbing off your tires is also go going somewhere. And that's a couple of kilos of rubber from each tire over the years. And that's all microplastics that gets washed straight into the sea. So ultimately to reduce it, it just means personal sacrifices. It means don't drive a car, try to use public transport if that's your drive. And the weird thing is I got the answer so many times that like the little differences I make don't make any difference on a big scale. And yes, it is true to an extent, but if all the people who say they do a little bit or they could do a little bit, but they don't want to because it doesn't make a difference, would actually step up and do something, boy, we could reach a lot. And I think if we learned one thing in the last two weeks or however long it lasted now, is that lots of people can change a lot in a very short time. So that for me was actually the most impressive thing in the last couple of days. And yeah, it's consumption, it's the way we we use all the resources. It's not just the little things like bringing your own cotton bag to a supermarket, because ultimately the plastic bag was an ingenious invention of a young man who wanted to save the trees. In case you never heard the story, it's one of my favorites. Because the, well, basically the guy who made the first plastic bag made it because at the time most bags were made out of paper. And that ultimately meant that you needed lots of wood to produce them. So basically big areas of forest were just chopped down in order to produce paper bags. And he said he's going to save the forest. He designed this beautiful bag that you can use a hundred times and it's virtually indestructible. So that was the first plastic bag. And he would carry it around in his pocket for days, weeks, months and just keep using it. And at some point along the road, we came to believe that plastic is something we just use once and then it gets thrown out. And by the very nature of it, plastic is made for eternity. So it is designed to last forever. And that's the one thing that it really does incredibly well. So it doesn't matter what it is, if it is, I don't know, headphones or scissors or anything made out of plastic, it will last a long time. So if you throw it away, it's not gone. And that's one of the big lessons everybody who ever spends some time on a boat will learn. Your trash does not disappear. Here we throw it in a bin and somebody else takes care of it, which is amazing, but it's a luxury. And yeah, it just doesn't disappear. And if at some stage it finds its way into the oceans, it will be sitting there for decades to come. And some of the trash we found also in Myanmar was like 20 year old wrappers which is pretty incredible, actually. Um, yeah, and ultimately, it also finds its way back to us because a big piece of plastic, it might seem to disappear, but it will just break down to smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And ultimately, it will be so small that it finds its way back into a food chain. So it might get eaten by plankton, which then gets eaten by fish, and so on. And then still the bottom line is that plastic, in our case, we can't digest it. So the theory is that it's just going out the other end just the way it came in, in our face. It goes out our butts. But the reality is that plastic is not as clean plastic as it could be. So there's colors in it, there's uh, softeners in it, there's all sorts of extra chemicals in it. And those are clearly not healthy for us. So they are actually quite toxic in some cases. And the plastic itself acts like a magnet. So it's kind of sucking all those, well, quite toxic things onto it. And even a microplastic particle, like a tiny little one, will have lots of these substances gathered around it. So if, for example, plankton or small animal eats this microplastic, 
it will get rid of plastic again, but all these toxins will be in the system of the animal. And the way that all these things work is that they tend to enrich within a food chain. So for example, if you had Quicksilver, just as an example for any toxic, um, with every step of a food chain, it would accumulate and be about 10 times the amount as it was before. So for example, if in the soil around the house here, there was an amount of Quicksilver in it, the grass would suck it out of the soil. So in the grass, you have 10 times the amount of the Quicksilver that gets eaten by a cow, which get, it gets eaten by us maybe. So inside us, we have about a thousand times the amount of Quicksilver or whatever nasty substance you want to choose as it was in the soil. And a thousand times more is already a lot. But on land, the food chains tend to be super short. So if you do the same game in the ocean, you have an amount of yeah, softeners, quicksilver, or what, what, whichever one you want to pick that is in the water to start with. This gets digested or ingested by phytoplankton, by tiny zooplankton, by some smaller shrimp, by some small fish, by a wrasse, some bigger fish gets eaten by tuna and that gets eaten by us. So, all of a sudden we got seven zeros, which is like 10 million. So really we are not doing a lot of good to us. And that's also the reason why when you want to eat fish, you should be really picky about which one you want to choose. So if you want to start low in the food chain, for example, if you keep eating tuna, chances are you slowly start poisoning yourself. And fish farms are also not the ultimate solution. Um, that was one of the other questions I got on Facebook earlier this week. So why fish farms are actually not the perfect solution for the whole fisheries issues. And yeah, while fisheries are a big problem for the ocean because they catch so much fish and so much food comes out of it. Uh, the bottom line is we are running out of fish. So every year, all the big fishing companies, they have to write their reports and then comes out how much fish did they catch with what kind of effort. And the truth is that we have been growing our fishing fleets around the world over the last 60 years, pretty much constant. And yet in the last 30 years, so ever since the end of the 90s, more or less, uh, the catches every year have been going down, which means even though we have more and more fishing boats, we catch less and less. So in return, that means that we're running out of fish. So obviously the solution could have been to just start farming fish, just like we farm chicken or cows or anything else. And there the little drawback is that the fish that we like to eat or we tend to eat is generally speaking predators. So they are fish that are high up in the food chain and that live off eating other fish, which means they have to eat fish. And fish has this quality of tasting like the stuff it eats. So that's why the predators are the ones that are high up in our wish list or on the menus. But that also means that every fish farm usually comes with, depending on the size, a fishing boat or a fishing fleet. And the big ones are usually the salmon farms. So they are right now in Patagonia mostly. And they come attached with massive fleets. So we're talking about big bottom trawling boats that actually catch so much that the local fish stocks or the local dolphin stocks, seabirds, they starve to death. And in the last years, there was reports popping up over and over again of mass strandings of dolphins. And when they sliced them open later on and checked what the hell was wrong with them, because it took a while or it puzzled many people for a long time to work that out. But they eventually found out that they literally starved to death. So there was just not enough food for them to survive. And that is simply because there's big fleets catching fish to feed it to fish. And with the growth rate of fish, it's the same as with the toxins that are accumulating. So to grow a fish by a kilo, you need to feed it about 10 kilos. Obviously, it's, there's a big difference between different kinds of fish. 
So some only need three kilos, some need up to 25. But like as a rule of thumb, the one to 10 ratio works pretty well. And so Dodo is asking, are there any fish species that would be more sustainable and still tasty choice for farming? Um, there is a few way it works. So for marine fish, it's pretty tricky because the ones that we eat are generally speaking the ones high up on the fish food chain. The ones where it kind of works at a decent rate are like smaller ones. So go for sardines and such. Anything that is, yeah, small scale is as tendency the better choice. And then of course there's fish farms that work really well. For example, in Austria, or freshwater fish in general is much easier. In Austria, we have this luxury of having pretty much unlimited resources in terms of freshwater. So also big amounts of nutrients in the fish pool are not a big issue because we can simply dilute them with all the water that we got. And there's some that work really well. Also in Switzerland, there's a salmon farm that, well, they, it's called sustainable protein. So they feed their salmon that they grow clearly landlocked. Um, yeah, sustainable protein. And that's something you will come across quite a bit. So also plenty of MSC certified uh, farmed fish will say they feed them sustainable protein. The weird thing is if you dig into it a little bit more and you ask them what the hell is sustainable protein, which is something I did in the past, uh, the answer was something like, oh, well, there's 1% um, algae and there's some uh, herbs and some sawdust and other things. I said, okay, great. So what's the other 95%? And turned out it was chicken. So many of you might or might not know that chicken eggs or in many parts of the world come out of these big factories where basically the baby male eggs or the baby males get shredded. So these shreds get pushed back into pellets or pressed into pellets and that's fed to fish farms, for example. Also gets used as fertilizer on fields and many other things, but also that's sustainable protein. But yeah, in terms of sustainable farming, I would really go for the small, smallest scale you could possibly get a hold of. And the tendency for me is to more aim towards fresh water than salt water. And yeah, Liam said oyster farms, and those actually do work. Yeah, depending on where you want to pick your poison. Dodo was asking about the fish, so I kind of stuck with the fish. But if you want to talk seafood all in all, of course, oysters or mussels all together are a good option because they are filter feeders. All they need is some stable structure. So it could be, yeah, in many cases, it's really just a couple of buoys with lines or cages in between where the oysters or whatever the mussel might be in that particular case grows on. And you don't have to feed them. So all they need is water around them that has something in it. So they filter feed, means they catch all the plankton or whatever else might be in the water, and that's what they feed off. It also means that if you do eat mussels, you should ideally know where they're coming from. So in terms of oysters, I know Liam is from Australia, so oysters on Christmas, I think, was a big tradition, and people get really picky about where they come from. So if there's oysters that were grown somewhere near harbor, nobody would take them, which is a fair point because, well, near harbor, the water tends to be a little bit dirty. And ultimately, this is what the oysters have been eating all their life. But it also means, yeah, you should stay away from harbors or big industries because you never really know what's in the wastewater. Also, lots of boats mean lots of anti-fouling, which again, is basically toxins that are released into the water. And mussels, just like many other filter feeding animals, can digest that or ingest it anyways. Um, <clears throat> and if you have mussels or oysters that grow in areas where there's very little stuff in the water, it also means they would grow slower. So that kind of backfires in itself. 
but in a perfect world, yeah, muscles are something that you can sustainably grow. The thing that really throws me off muscles in many cases is, well, for one, you don't really know what's inside of them. And some muscles actually have lots of eyes. So that always freaked me out. Because as a muscle, if you get eaten by an octopus, for example, you have to stare at the guy coming at you with like 60-something eyes. I think that's quite a horrible way to go. Um, yeah, in an oyster farm, I would say the, the big piece of advice I can give you is make sure that you know where your oysters grew. Okay, anything else you guys want to know? Because I have something that I would ask from you. So. First of all, obviously, if you have contacts in the Mediterranean, now that we are stuck here, it would be great to get a couple of eyes on the ground, not just for the invasive species and the seagrass, but also we are working together with a couple of others who are looking for marine mammals and many other species. Um, whoop, there's another one. Microplastics in the Mera Trench. Uh, and if we can ever clean up all the plastics that we dumped in the ocean. Oh boy, uh, that's a big one. So, ocean plastics is a massive big topic. And luckily there's a couple of companies or NGOs that are focusing on getting it all out. The biggest or most known one probably is the Ocean Cleanup and they build big structures to collect all the floating plastic in the seas, which is great. And if it did work and as far as I know, they are still kind of struggling with the ocean cleanup purposes. Now they kind of switch to machines that collect all the floating plastics already on the river mouths, which works a lot better and basically you're catching it where it comes from. But bottom line is only about 20%, and that's an optimistic number, of all the plastic that is in the ocean actually floats. So there's 80% that are gone to start with and from the 20% that initially float, most of it will sink once things start growing on it. And that's always just a matter of time. So it might be mussels, it might be algae, it might be all sorts of things that can attach to it, but ultimately it will start sinking down to the bottom, which means it's out of sight and therefore out of mind for most of us. But on the bottom, there is a lot more. And I had the questionable pleasure of going diving rather deep in certain spaces and I don't think I've ever made a dive where I didn't see any plastic. And yeah, recently there was a new species discovered also in the Mariana Trench, like tiny little crab or not crab, crustacean, um, that had plastic in it and it was actually named Plasticus or something something Plasticus. But yeah, plastic is everywhere. It does end up everywhere. I mean, currents are carrying it around the world. But if we ever can clean it all up, I think the more likely scenario is that something will evolve that will more effectively digest plastic. And we do already have fungi, we have microorganisms that can digest plastic. But at this point, the situation is that they will only digest plastic if there's nothing else around. So you have to put them in an environment where they have to eat the plastic. And only then they will actually digest it. But even then, they are so incredibly slow that you basically need to, like the area of a soccer field to digest a cup of plastic in a week. It was some outrageous number. But basically, if you want to solve the plastic problem of this planet, just by digesting it with microorganisms, you need an extra two or three planets to just deal with all of it. Um, we have this mechanism for carbon sinking. <laughs> um, plastic as carbon sink. Well, ultimately, plastic is oil. So in a way, you bind the carbon in the plastic with stuff growing on it. It will sink down. Ah. Uh, I would say that's, what's the English term? Double-sided sword? So, of course, it means there's carbon that's taken out of the system in a way, but ultimately it will break down. So I don't think the plastic is really a long-term solution in terms of carbon sink. And 
as a carbon sink, I'd always much rather see something living, like seagrass. Amazing carbon sink. Plastic only binds that much, and it will never bind anymore. It doesn't have any options to grow. It has more of an option to, well, fall apart and deteriorate, or be eaten by something else that eventually finds its way back to us. And basically, the moment it's eaten or pooed out, it's free carbon again. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I don't really see that as a solution for the whole carbon emissions. Hey, on a plus note though, carbon emissions have gone down by 25% globally in the last week. So, hey, that's a little win. Yeah, but yeah, obviously plastic and carbon are tied together pretty tightly, mostly because, well, they have the same source. And of course they play together. And for me, the production of plastic is already using so much carbon just because it's very energy, uh, energy efficient, energy hungry. And I think that's where a major mind shift in our heads has to happen as well. Because in our heads, is it's still so easy to grab a plastic spoon somewhere where I get a soup from a takeaway shop. And still it means to produce that plastic spoon Somewhere in the world, probably some oil rig is pumping out the oil, then it's getting repurposed, refurbished into plastic. Usually little pellets to start with, those get shipped around the world a couple of times, then they get melted, they get put into the shape of the spoon, that gets shipped around the world again, and all of a sudden it shows up at the little noodle stand where I stop, and it's so damn convenient to just grab the spoon and use it for five minutes before I throw it away. So just in terms of that, I think this little spoon has chewed through so much energy and really should be so much more expensive than it is. So we just came to the point where it's considered so simple, even though I think it's much easier to just wash a metal spoon or keep one with you if you want. But yeah, that's where the major mind shift has to kind of get a grip. And I think the younger generations are very much on top of it. And the shift in the mindset has started and things are definitely getting better. And if you talk to younger people, they have a much clearer, much more defined understanding of what it takes to make sure the world keeps going around. And that's, well, thanks to lots of initiatives, lots of public work, lots of NGOs that have been pushing the topic. Yeah. And on that happy note, I think for today we're well and done. If people do have more questions, though, feel free to ask them. And I'm happy to do something like this again in the next couple of days or over and over again, depending on how long we will all be arrested in our little homes. And yeah, please don't forget to give us a little thumbs up. Feel free to share this with friends and invite them for the next round. And I hope to see you all again soon. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for stopping by, guys. Toodles.